back for Quantum Bible 2 and we're still looking at what is the anaphoric center you take each anaphora you plot out its occurrences and then you, in order it's real important to do it in order and then it's like okay there's ten of them here and so there have to be two in the middle there's nine of them here there has to be one in the middle nine of them here one in the middle okay and then you look at the aggregate where it's like six and seven and eight okay that's your center now I did it differently in Matthew because that was so much more longer and complicated this thing only runs to 956 AD so I don't think I have to go through that okay I don't see you know because this is starting in verse 1 and then verse 3 well this starts in verse 3 and that also starts in verse 3 so there's a symmetry already there okay you're looking for symmetry and you're looking for the center it's like Russian nested dolls okay that's how Paul did it and I learned that seven years ago and that's kinda where I'm going with this okay now we're gonna test it you're always testing I sound dogmatic when I say things but the truth is there could be one big factor that I missed that could change the whole equation it's just like physics okay string theory is really is really just that it's a bunch of really plausible hypotheses that make a whole lot of sense but one discovery can undo the whole thing same thing here okay so we have our putative center at 6 through the end of verse 8 6 as we saw was starting at 340 AD with the death of one of the bro one of the sons of Constantine who was trying to kill one of his brothers so you got two brothers left at the beginning of the verse here and of course he the, the remaining two brothers one of them has just become Kai Kaiser of the brother who died back up here so that's you know the ribald humor I actually didn't I didn't actually check that off, did I? Alright, so then we gotta do a font thing. Um, Constans. We'll just do it that way. Constans Kai. I'll just say Kai Constans. Whoop. <clears throat> it didn't copy it. All right, so we'll do it again. Kai Constans, because he's a Kaiser at the beginning of the verse. Oops, it didn't work. How come it didn't work? Now it works. Kai Constans ends up dying by the by the end of the verse. He dies right here during drunk. Did he die being drunk? Maybe, maybe not. I'd have to go look it up. But the big characteristic of this period is a lot of fighting over the definition of God. It did not stop with this guy trying to kill his brother. It goes on. And so when it says here that, you know, and I saw the woman drunk and then it goes on with the blood of the saints. Saint just means saved. And with the blood of those who testified witnesses for Jesus. Now these are mature people versus just being saved. This just means saved. It comes from Hebrews uh, 10, 14. Okay, it's actually ten, verse, Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verses 5 through 14. We're talking about Christ sanctified everybody for all time on the cross. Sanctifies means set apart. <clears throat> so it's, it has nothing to do with how developed you are spiritually. You're saved. And you're sanctified therefore to heaven. But this, the blood of those who are for the testimony of Christ. This is Jesus. Okay, Yesu. Um, that, that means maturity. Okay, it doesn't have to mean maturity. And the big problem with the church father writings is that they call martyrs. This is where we get the word martyr from. It really means witness. 
witness like in a witness stand in a trial <coughs> where, where the prosecutor is asking you questions and your answer is going to determine whether you get judged or not so that ends up being called martyr but it's not a good word okay witness in the Bible to be able to be able to say that you're a witness for Christ is not knocking on doors it means you know something which means you have some kind of maturity here alright so the Bible's distinction about witness is not what we say in common Christian parlance which is just bilious alright but what you're seeing happen here is the woman is drunk with the blood of the saints meaning the saved and drunk with the blood of those who gave testimony to Christ in other words they actually knew something alright so they were somewhat mature or maybe fully mature there aren't too many fully mature people here though so this period Constance dies himself right here that leaves Constant Constantius the second who ends up dying just a year after this and he too is a Kai okay I'm gonna have to make a note about that okay oh I did I made a note about that the following year he just becomes a mere Kai again see this is a pattern this keeps on occurring to do that they're timing the Kai's to the deaths of these emperors and it's a way of putting them down it's a way of saying hi you think you're big stuff down here but you're just a connective dot in history you don't matter a lot of times you don't even translate the Kai which you know and even <clears throat> in fact a lot of times it's just a bullet point which is how it's being used here so hi you think you're, you're emperor of the Roman Empire yeah well you're just a connected dot in history it's really biting and I covered that in the sarcasm tour but what I'm trying to do here is figure out why is this the center of history alright is it it's like the trends of the church age why is this the center it is also standing for what's going to happen during the tribulation but that's like the final iteration of this trend this is what Satan keeps this is if, if you were to give this chapter a title If you were to give Revelation 17 a title, the title would be Satan's Gambit or Satan's Plan. All right here. Okay? And then history shows how the plan works so that when you come to your time, even if it's past 956 AD, you don't need more text to tell you because you've got so many examples in the past. Past this prologue. So, the center of that past determines kind of like, um, I don't know how to put it, um, the determining set of variables that keep on playing. Okay, one of them is being drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs, or, you know, the witnesses. That that's a trend that's going to keep on going as a center of history a repeating like hub the other thing that's gonna that's the first thing because that's here here and here we've now gotten past all the kids because he dies Constantius the last the last son dies here and I think the of the three sons it was like one daughter and I think she died childless they did not have four generations of kids which in the Bible is another way to snub people okay so now we're going into a sort of a degrading period of history where it's like fighting over God that's what these th three things are drunk with the blood of the saints with the blood of the witnesses that's trend number one at the center trend number two at the center and, and this is John saying it himself and I was, and I'm going to have to explain this, I was dumbstruck when I saw her with great, they translated wonder and that's not the right 
with great shock. Let me tell you, th this is style mazo. Whenever you have an adzo ending to a Greek verb, it means it's really strong. Okay? Thaumadzo. Think of adzo, the strength of that sound. Okay. Thaumadzo. When you hear about Trump every single day and you say to yourself, how is that possible? That's with disapproval, of course. Or when you were watching the planes fly into the buildings at nine on 9-11. You're looking at it. You're dumbstruck. And part of you it, in your mind is saying, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I can't believe it. So you look again. And then, oh, no, it's not possible. And then you look again. And then it's not possible. And you look again. Now, you could be saying that in your mind because of something great that happens like if a billion dollars showed up on your kitchen floor you would look at it and oh no not look at it again oh no not because you want it to be true but it's like too much it's too much so you go into sort of you're sort of dumbstruck you're shocked and they usually translate it like amazed well yeah but amazed in English is just really too tame astonished is better but it dumbstruck would be better you just your open mouth and like huh if you had a billion dollars show up on your kitchen floor you'd just be staring at it with your mouth open part of you would be really glad about it and part of you would be saying no I must be dreaming this there's a disbelief that's an undercurrent because it's too much to believe whether you like it or not it's too much to believe this is John's attitude when he's looking at the woman being drunk. He's just like dumbstruck looking at her. And then when you repeat something like that in Greek like this, he's, he's trying to reinforce it. So he's, I'm dumbstruck looking at her with a great drumstruck, dumbstruckness, great amazement. Great is mega and thauma. Is, ah, think of it open mouth all right and then said to me the angel why for what cause are you dumbstruck and then I will tell you all right so that's the completed thought of the second like trend you're just looking at it and looking at it and looking at it and part of you can't believe it and you, so you keep looking it's like, is this real? Is this real? So you look. Like every day, uh, most of us in America are like, Trump is really president? And you think, oh no, I must be dreaming. This can't be true. La la la. And you're, you're dumbstruck. Now, what's going on here? The first was the, the, the sort of like persecution. And you'll notice that this is when it's mentioned, drunk with the blood of the saints. It's not mentioned back in the pagan days, even though Diocletian did do persecuting. The real persecution doesn't start until Constantine. And all you have to do is look at the laws. See right there. At 4thCentury.com. And you'll be dumbstruck. You'll just be dumbstruck at, the, at how bad those laws are. Truly nasty. Okay, so the, the nasty language about being drunk with the blood of the saints is reserved for Christian rulers. So you can kind of see why John is dumbstruck. It's like, but these are Christians. Why are they killing fellow Christians? It's Christian against Christian. Yeah. We're, we're in that same phase now. That's what's happening in Russia as I talk. All right, it was happening in Russia for a long time but it's gone up and it's gone down in severity and it's starting to go up in severity now so much so that they're even reaching to France in order to persecute um, some JW's because they're not Russian Orthodox not JW is a you know apostate religion but so is Russian Orthodox and why in France I just read that this morning and um, I forget what the complaint was, but it's some kind of legal matter that's going on right now. The point is, 
that this is persecution of Christians by Christians. So no wonder John's going to be standing there looking at the beast, the woman on the beast, gumstruck that, you know, hi, it's Christian against Christian. How can that be? See, the disbelief. All right? Now, this is the sort of fallout from after Constantius dies. Constantius died on his way to get rid of Julian. He had appointed Julian co Caesar, and then Julian was too popular in the West, so Constantius starts running to the West because he was in the East, and he dies on the on the way. And you know, I think it's like his deathbed or something. Finally, says, "Okay, Julian, you get to be emperor now." Julian only reigns for like three years. And then I want to say it's a guy named Jovian who's next, and I forget who's after him. The point is, is that it's like musical chair emperors. Meanwhile, the Christians underneath them, you know, and Julian was trying to do some persecution of the Christians himself, but he didn't live very long. Um, the Christians beneath them, with or without the emperors trying to do anything, they were persecuting fellow Christians themselves. And there's a link where you can sort of like get some detail on it because I put a lot of links in there. That's in my Ephesians document. Because Ephesians made a big stink about that. So the aftermath of Constantine's sons is a sort of power vacuum and everybody's sort of jockeying around. There's a little bit of stability because there's some relatives that were related to the to the Constantine sons, but they don't last too long. And then it starts getting kind of you know wacko. All right, and it's like when general takes over and then the general takes over. Meanwhile, the Christians are are going against each other over who's more holy. And there's this split that's occurring. Okay. I cover it more in the Mark 13 video, so I don't really want to spend a lot of time on this now. The thing I'm trying to get at are the trends that mark this as like paradigmal. So first trend is Christian against Christian. That's a, these these first three clauses here. The second is like the shock of it. This can't be true, but it is true. This can't be true, but it is true. And you're looking at it. So one is the the sort of shock of the persecution going on. The other is the is is looking at the persecution going on, or just looking at what's going on, and that's kind of like what everybody's doing with Christians now. It's like, how can you Christians support Trump? All right. So this is very paradigmal for our time now. All right. Although we're not physically killing each other. All right. And then you you got the third factor. It's like you, you sort of come to your senses and like, well, why, why am I so shocked? All right? And now he's going to explain what, what's the cause of all this. All right? And he sort of says, I will tell you. The mystery. The word mystery is a word that Paul coined in um, Ephesians 3. And the actual word mysterio means doctrines known. There's nothing mysterious about it. It's doctrines known. But it's known inside a group. They don't communicate what they know outside their group. Okay? So when you hear about the Elysian Mysteries or you hear about the Bacchic Mysteries and all that, that means that it's an experience of a group within itself that they don't communicate to outsiders. Okay, well, in the case of Bible, the information is right out here. You're looking at it, but people look at it and say, well, what is it? Well, what is it? Well, what is it? Well, the answer is, kind of like this Thalmazo, they don't believe what they're looking at. It's not that they don't know. That's the big deal. It's no. But it might as well be a mystery to you. Because you're looking at it as if you didn't know. Okay? Or it's available to know. 
but you don't try to know. Okay? So that's where we get the English word mystery from. Alright? So I will tell you about the mystery. That's the church. That's the designation for church. He's going to use it again later. Of the woman and the beast that's carrying her. Or right, bearing, literally. And the beast. Now this is about the beast. Having, and there's too much made of this. Having seven heads and ten horns. In the Bible, when they have like metaphors, they're always defined somewhere. So you could search everywhere you want in the Bible for the word head. Head implies thinking, head implies executive authority, head implies, you know, chief top dog concept. And horn everywhere it looks is the idea of force being able to get your way. Alright? It also has a sexual connotation. I shouldn't have to explain. Okay? Prowess. Force. Ability to get what you want. Because you have this power that others don't have that you can put over them if you want. And head has something of that same connotation. But here it's more like you're good at what you do or you're an expert at what you do or you're a recognized authority at what you do. Here, it's, it can just be brute force. Alright, so this is Kerata. This is Kefalas. This accent mark here at the end, that's wrong. I, when I pasted it, it's putting little accent marks on the last syllable. That's bad Greek. That's not in the actual text. It's, all, it's almost always on the penultimate syllable, never on the last. Well, sometimes on the last, but... It's Kerata. Just forget this. Ignore that little accent mark there. The actual text text doesn't have any accent marks at all. Okay, so we got blood of the saints. The marveling at that, like this can't be true, can't be true, can't be true. Then the third reaction is like, why are we wondering this? It's right in front of our eyes. And then we start to get into, okay, well, what's the explanation? What's the inside information would be a good translation of mystery. Of uh, the woman, the whore, but he's calling her a woman now. And there's also a nickname for wife. And, you know, we say that in English too. My woman, instead of saying my wife, somehow that's more folksy and more personal and more loving. Okay? Belongingness, if we say woman. Wife has got more legal connotation an office okay and the and the beast carrying her so now this part of it is like analysis of why what's going on is going on alright so that's psychological that, these are like psychological stages you could say alright but they're also historical stages historically this is what happened and of course you know when you're killing each other and killing each other you eventually get tired of it because you keep on killing each other, there's not going to be anything left to kill each other for. Alright? So then you're just, ah, dumbstruck. Why are we going through this? Okay? So what they started to do is they started to coalesce. Okay? I'm, I'm trying to just keep out the people and just talk about the trends here. Okay? But there's a guy... And this is part of the same trend that I'm talking about the, um, psychologically, named Theodosius. And he was basically a general, and he comes to power during this time here. Okay? And when he comes to power there, it's because everybody was exhausted from killing each other. And he unites the empire briefly. But not for long. He ends up having two kids. And, and, that's when he hasn't. Okay? So, he splits the empire for his two sons, Arcadius and Honorius. Two classically bad emperors. Um, well, dilettantes. And he no sooner does that, splits them between his sons, he dies two years later, right on time. Okay? 
So now we're entering a period here where we're getting, as it were, a, a, you know, if you're sitting here saying, well, why? That means you have some time. That means you have some relaxation. Yeah, because you're exhausted from fighting each other for the last 50 years. On top of that, you got two really lazy emperors. And they got, their advisors are doing all the work for them. And their advisors, you got one in the west and one in the east. And the advisors that are advising each of the emperors are looking at each other across the, the land, so to speak. And the guy in the west is looking at the guy in the east. And the guy in the east is looking at the guy in the west. And they're all sort of jealous of each other. Okay? At the same time, the advisors are really really competent because they've had all this war experience meanwhile the barbarians are at the door meanwhile Jerome is sitting there in Palestine finishing up he, he finished up his gospels in 398 and in 405 he's finally finished all of his his retranslation of what we now call the Vulgate in 405 which is really good because um, by this point the East and West have split a lot and you know because we got Honorius and Arcadius and you know they're brothers but they're, they really don't you know care about each other that much and their advisors even less so if the West didn't have Jerome's Bible I'm not so sure that there would have been one okay Stilicho, in the West, because he's so good at what he does, gets a lot of jealousy from Byzant Byzantines, but they're all really weak at this point. And like I said, both, both emperors are dilettantish. So, why do you wonder? I'll tell you. See, that, that implies you're, you're sort of like relaxing now. Alright? So we got... Five, 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 blood, 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 brother against brother, which you'll see Mark talk about it that way. And then like, what? Why? What's going on here? Dumbstruck. I can't believe it. And then you look again. I can't believe it. And then you look again. That's Dalmazzo. And then there's a break. And that's Theodosius. And now you're sort of taking stock. Well, supposedly, this would be what it would be good for. And Jerome, in the meantime, has finished his Vulgate. Now, he was commissioned to do that, so there was some interest in Bible going on, which would account for why there's a sort of slowdown here. Okay? And that's why it's so clever, clever about this, because the mystery of the woman, all right, I'm going to get to the, the pun in a minute, but the mystery of the woman, well, see, see, r religion is the woman. We were introduced to that at the beginning. Okay, so the Vulgate, but that's Bible. So here's the mystery part, the real Word of God, that's sort of hidden and yet known, because you everybody's memorizing the words, and yet they don't know what the, they mean at all. But it's prevalent. Okay, and then you've got the religion, which is the whore. Side by side, the real word of God, here it is, the mystery for church, and then the whore, religion. Whore is always, the, religion is always depicted as a whore in the Old Testament. That's how come I can tell you so confidently what it is. Now is it the Catholic whore, or the Protestant whore, or the this denomination whore, or the that denomination whore, we'll take your pick. Anything that's not scriptural. And, of course, one side is going to say the other side is not scriptural. And that's what they were fighting for with all this blood being shed, Christian against Christian. But they're tired now. And so, oh, good, now that you're tired, and Jerome has just finished putting out the book in, in current Latin, because the other Latin was 200 years old, are you going to look at the book now? Hmm? Or just sit here and say, oh, why do you wonder? Well, here's the book, and then here's the whole religion, whatever it was, side by side at that time. Now, because this guy, Honorius, and this guy, Arcadius, were brothers, 
their advisors were sort of jealous of each other, but like I said, they were all tired out. And I forget if it was Honorius or Arcadius who just wanted to tend to his chickens. Okay, but one of them was like that. Meanwhile, the Vandals are knocking at the door. That's where Stilicho comes in in the West. Or was it in the East? I forget. I think it's West. Anyway, Honorius, I think, yeah, Honorius, Honorius outlives his brother. Because there's Honorius. Okay. I shouldn't make that eight. It should be a nine. All right. So Arcadius dies first. Now look at this. This is so cute. Mysterion does not mean mystery. It means secret doctrines known inside a group. Like the Bible. It's a secret to you if you don't know what it says because you haven't read it. So it's a mystery to you. But that doesn't mean it's forced to be a secret or it's special that it's a secret. And God came to me in a dream last night. You know, that kind of crap. No. Here it is, right in front of your face. This is the secret of the Word of God. Yes, it's in Greek. They spoke Greek then. Everybody in this part of the world spoke Greek then. On west and east of Rome. Okay. Arcadius dies, but nobody was sure how. So he's dying at the T. Right there. He doesn't even qualify to be a Kai. He's just a T. Now, in Greek, T, depending on how you say it and write it, this isn't quite the way you'd spell it, is an enclitic particle. Okay, which is denoting a close relationship between the thing that the particle precedes and the thing that follows the particle. Well, that's as close as you can get being part of the same word, mystery. Yeah, Bible was a mystery to him. As far as anybody knows. Okay, now in the East, we have this real bitch with a <laughs> stupid name. Paul Caria. It, was, it means beautiful. There's nothing beautiful about her. Okay? And she's a regent for her younger brother, Theodosius II. See, because this Theodosius died. So, Theodosius II is her younger brother. And she's going to she's gonna play mommy to him. And she's like 17 or something in the, at that point. And so she decides everything that's going to happen for her little brother. Now, when the Bible covers people who are young at the top of the heap, like 16, 17, you got young boy emperors and all that, which is what's going on here, that means that the, there's a lot of politicking going on behind them over by the adults. So this is not a good time. So you have, again, side by side, here's the Bible, some of the rulers, some of the um, regents were good, alongside the horse, those were just trying to curry favor, and that's what you got here. She was just awful. Everything about this woman, I have yet to find anything about her that was good. Okay, just awful, and Paul, Paul in Ephesians really lambasts her with the wording that he uses. Okay. Theodosius was mm, trying to get out from under, but he was so young. Alright? So, then Honorius dies. Okay? At Tos. Which is kind of funny. See, this word means to bear a burden. Bear a burden, in other words, you got like, you, like you're you bend your back over and you have this big basket of rocks and you have to walk with your bent your bent back until you get to the part of the quarry where you can dump the rocks all right so it's like bastas on tas you can just oh. all right toss that's when honorius dies i forget what he died of at this point, all right, you got in the east, Polkaria, who's like 17, over her brother, who's like 15. So the adults are, you know, playing games behind their back about who's who's more powerful, the real ruler of the, of the empire in the east. Now we're looking at the west, okay, 
and I, I want to say the problem with him is that he had uh, a sister who he married off. But there was a little kind of game going on here because in between, which I didn't explain, we have Attila, we have Attila the Hun, and the Sack of Rome, which was 410. Alright, so the Sack of Rome, see, Klaus, we got, we got four syllables. Klaus, Anai, Gu, that's three, four. Okay, so just before, <laughs> this is so cute. Just before Teskunekas. Oops. Where where is it? There we go. Just before this word starts is the sack of Rome. Western Rome. And what came out of that was this guy's sister ran off with one of the one of the vandal I don't know if it was a vandal or a goth. Ran off with them for a while. And then comes back. And then he's ticked at her and he marries her off to a general who then dies. And her kid is going to end up ruling next. See, this is one of the weird things in history. So look. Carrying a burden. Okay. Beast of burden. Alright. And we got a beast here. And then the beast is carrying a woman on top of him. You see the wit? The woman, her name was Galia Placida. Okay. I'm going to fill in more of this as time passes because I'm trying to still figure out what, what the Bible is really stressing here. But the beast, the, the wit of this is the woman is her. Okay. It, it's, it's double entendre. Okay. The beast was the vandal or the who's the, what's his that carried her off after the sack of Rome. And then bringing her back to Honorius, who's going to make her carry the burden of kids for whoever he marries her off to. You see, the Bible can be extremely witty like this. And in particular with these... Um, I don't know why it's not doing... Did I not do a hyperlink? I don't think I did a hyperlink. I got to do hyperlinks with this one and this one. But with these particular blue highlighted seeing verbs, there's a lot more bite than I just described to you about Galia Placida. And I'm just trying to figure out how do I condense all the information of wit and sarcasm in these verbs that are specifically about emperors who died their successors and then it's like see this one this one is seeing the horror be drunk and this one is seeing the beast that was and it's got bite for that period specific to those years for those emperors and I'm trying to figure out well what's that telling me so that's why I'm introducing this thing about Gallia Placida because she was like the one who was like vaguely related still to Constantinian dynasty. They had a kid. Okay. So the upshot then is that by the time you get at the end of verse 7, it's like, okay, then we have a change in the power structure. We got a woman being born by a beast with all that double entendre I just explained. We got the two emperors of the two um, sections of the empire now dead. Alright. So then it makes sense if you've got a vacuum of power that you're going to have seven heads and ten horns. What does that mean? Who does that signify? Because remember, we're still talking about core of history. Everything is supposed to be coming out of this period. So what is it so special about this period? And I'll pick that up in the next increment.